Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is an interesting experience for me. I'm looking forward to it. The question is, is religion dangerous? The answer, in short, is yes. It's very dangerous. It's a very important force in history. I presume you're asking the question because you suspect that religion may be perceived to be dangerous to people who have certain values. The values that we all share probably in this room, which we could loosely call enlightenment values values of highly educated people who believe in reason and science, pride themselves on tolerance and care about social justice. Is religion dangerous to things that matter to us? And by religion, what do you mean? Let's focus it slightly by saying monotheism, a belief in a God who created the world, sustains the world, and has a will for it a goal for it, and particularly for the human race that he created. Those of us in this room uh, who are Americans, particularly those of us who are white, are the heirs of many centuries of slavery, and our lives have been greatly enriched by the forced labor of many black people from Africa over several centuries. Slavery is almost a universal in human history among agricultural peoples. But here in the Americas, it reached a particularly mean and, and, and vicious form in what was called capitalist slavery, run by Christian powers controlling this part of the world. Think of these images, a Catholic priest in Africa blessing a ship as slaves are carried off to the Americas. Or in the United States South, Protestant clergy who themselves were slave owners and defenders of slavery. So Christians in this part of the world have a shameful heritage but there was in only one civilization in history where a, a sustained abolitionist movement arose, a movement to attack and destroy slavery, and that was the Christian West. A long process by which people inspired by certain values attacked first the slave trade, then slavery itself, and then went on to attack it in other countries. From the beginning, it was a religious movement. Throughout the decades in which it operated, most of the energy came from religious people, first Quakers, later evangelicals, both at the grassroots, where children were giving pennies uh, in Sunday school to support anti-slavery movements, right up to the Houses of Parliament, where the leaders typically were Christians. Now, scholars confronted with all the evidence for Christian dynamism in the war against slavery have attempted in certain ways to minimize or even explain it away. One tactic, uh, and an important one, one that I honor, is to look at the economic reasons why slavery collapsed, to see the development of industrial capitalism as destroying it. Another tactic has been to put emphasis more broadly on the Enlightenment, to say that um, in the late 18th century, a broader notion of human rights arose in a largely secular setting, particularly in France. Uh, the French revolutionaries declared in 1789, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. So we have an economic explanation, we have a broader explanation in terms of ideas. And both of them have enriched our understanding of the abolition of slavery. But they don't overpower the fact that the language 
and the impetus and the strength and the determination of religiously minded people were what made it happen. Now I'd like to shift from this to my own research on South Africa to another case that involves race. About the time you were born, in the early 1990s, most of you, uh, a racial system collapsed in South Africa that had been in existence for 350 odd years. A white minority which had gained control early in the 17th century and had dominated this, the black majority both economically and politically finally surrendered and an interracial democracy came into being. In 1948, when your parents were alive, the world was shocked by the introduction of a new system in South Africa called apartheid, which was concerned to impose on that country systematic segregation in land, in the country, and in the towns, job discrimination against blacks, petty humiliation of blacks, and political oppression that went all along with it. There were periodical upheavals in South Africa after 1948, nationwide violence, states of emergency, and so on and so forth. And in the midst of all of this, the Dutch Reformed Church, which was the church of the Afrikaners, the people, the white group that dominated the politics, the Dutch Reformed Church defended apartheid around the world. Now, in the anti-apartheid struggle, there were prominent churchmen, and there were also Hindus, Jews, and towards the end, lots of atheists in the Communist Party. By the time apartheid was starting to crumble, there was a worldwide human rights campaign against it. And when apartheid did end in 1994, the world celebrated uh, and saw it as a victory of enlightenment ideals over a country which had been dominated by bigoted Christians taught by a bigoted church. Now my research is on missionaries. Starting in the 1790s, South Africa was blanketed almost by mission stations, mostly Protestant but some Catholics, which preached a simple gospel that Jesus died for all people and that all of those people who accepted Jesus became brothers and sisters. This message was propagated in a society that was already dominated by whites over black and brown people. The message took, very, it took among black people fairly slowly at first. But by the time we get to the late 19th century, it's a snowball. And we get into the 20th century, the black population becomes majority Christian, and today it is overwhelmingly Christian. All of the education for black people in South Africa was run by missionaries, mission schools. There were no government schools. There are some exceptions, but leave that. Very few. In these mission schools, black converts learned the Christian gospel and many other things. They became a so-called middle class, which aspired to equality in society. They were taught that they were equal with white people in the eyes of God. They asked to be equal um, citizens of their own country. The missionaries themselves, and these are the people that I'm, uh, was, I've been writing about, started out by being somewhat critical of white supremacy. And throughout, they formed organizations, they protested, they did this and they did that. But I'm afraid my book is largely an expose of their hypocrisies, of their weakness, of the fact that they were tainted either by racism or by lack of faith in God. For whatever reason, they really didn't believe that whites and blacks could successfully be equal in South African society. My book also traces what I think is a golden thread of guilt through South African history, that whites in their dominant position felt deeply uneasy as Christians about the position that they were in uh, in society. As Christians, they believed they had an obligation to support missions, to spread the gospel among the black majority around them. 
but as whites, they could not see any way that that equality that was so deeply rooted in Christian teaching could be applied to their society. Now in the 1930s, in a time of great economic and political and social crisis, the Dutch Reformed Church, remember them? This is the Church of the Afrikaners who are the majority among the whites, Dutch people of Dutch descent, um, who more or less dominate political power in South Africa. The mission leaders of the Dutch Reformed Church found themselves caught in an impossible dilemma. On the one hand, their church was a church of white people, and it felt an obligation to look after the interests of those white people. Social interests, um, this is the time of the Depression, and so on and so forth, poverty among whites, and so on and so forth. So concern to be the church of this white community, but on the other hand, with a deep-seated conviction, they had an obligation to spread the gospel to black people. How can you be both a church of a white min dominant minority and be concerned about the economic and political and social development of the black majority when those two interests are con uh, in collision? The answer was they invented the doctrine of apartheid. They decided that the solution was for black people to be free to develop in their own areas with the church and state helping them in small areas scattered around the country where they could um, uh, establish schools, proceed along their own lines towards prosperity and eventually possibly to some kind of political independence. The apartheid doctrine, in other words, was an attempt to square a circle. It was an attempt to maintain, to cling to the Christian gospel of equality, but to insist that it could only operate if people were equal in separate spheres. This doctrine, which started in the church, was secularized. It was taken over by a political party, the National Party. In 1948, that party won an election and proceeded to impose apartheid on the society. And the Dutch Reformed Church acted as the apologist for this system, both within the country to solve the consciousness of whites and outside the country uh, to try to fend off some of the hostility that arose against, um, against apartheid. Christian Afrikaners generally supported apartheid. They thought it was a generous solution. However, they did not give up their privileges. They did not make major sacrifices to make this possible. And the system, as it was implemented by the government, was unbelievably destructive. As with abolition, an awful lot of the activity against apartheid was led by Christians. Um, both in the period I write about um, prior to the 1960 and the period um, thereafter. Now I want to briefly analyze the South African situation and then broaden it and then I will, I will stop. Almost the only voices against the racial order in South Africa for 200 years were Christian voices. Yet, Christians were deeply complicit in the racial order, most dramatically in creating and supporting apartheid. The racial order collapsed because the Christian idea, the Christian idea of equality prevailed. And that was made possible by Christian institutions like schools and churches. It was also aided by violence, international sanctions, and so forth. By the time apartheid was starting to crumble, Christians had been joined by people around the world of many religions and no religion at all. The language of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948 sort of summed up much of the global hostility to apartheid. Thus, when apartheid collapsed, it was seen by the New York Times and other um, spokespeople for the point of view that I think most of us share, it was seen as a triumph of a secular, enlightened world defeating a bigoted people. 
the Christian role of the Christian idea, uh, individuals, but also um, the Christian idea and its role were sort of sanitized out of the system. Okay, I've given you two examples, the abolition of slavery and the destruction of the racial order in South Africa. You might say I've picked two easy examples. All of us in this room abhor slavery, and all of us, if, if we knew about apartheid, would abhor it. So maybe these are easy examples where Christianity seems to be the good force. But actually, they're tough examples. Because evidence abounds, and I've presented a lot of it in my book, of Christians subverting the consequences of their own message. And for that reason, both cases that I've given you have been widely used to discredit Christianity, even though my story would give a much more positive role. I want to conclude by making a general comment about the secular optic or the secular um, platform from which we look at cases like this. I'm going to say this abstractly because I think in your discussions you could apply this to things other than race. You could apply it to, to many other stories. Um, even those of us that are Christian have heavily, are heavily uh, indebted to a secular worldview. And when we look at something like the abolition of slavery, or the destruction of apartheid, but in both of which cases there are a lot of religious people and religious ideas uh, involved, we easily see the hypocrisies of the religious people. We easily see their failings. But what we tend not to see, because we have certain lenses that need to be corrected, is we tend not to see two things. First, we don't see or we minimize the role of the religious idea. In this case, the two cases I gave you, the idea that all human beings are created by God, that Jesus died for all of them, and that those who accept Jesus are brothers and sisters. We tend not, we tend not to see the importance of that idea, focusing as we do on the hypocrisies of the religious people. The second error we tend to make is that we fail to see the religious sources of our own platform from which we are judging these religious people. I said that in only one civilization has an abolitionist movement ever arisen, and that was the Christian West. I could also say that the doctrine of human rights has emerged in the Christian West and clearly is deeply indebted to it including the fact that many of the authors of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 were devout Christians. Monotheistic religion is definitely dangerous because it posits a God who cares, who has a will. Monotheistic religion is popular. I'm speaking now of Christianity, Islam, and, and Judaism together. Monotheistic religion gives humans meaning. My life contributes to a bigger story. Monotheistic religion gives comfort. It says that death is not the end. But with the meaning and the comfort of monotheistic religion, and Christianity in particular, come discomfort, comes discomfort. God, after all, may disapprove, even wrathfully, some human behavior, some of mine some human arrangements. Let me just be personal in one brief moment. I'm a Christian, so I have to care what Jesus says. I'll call this Jesus of the religious right. Jesus says to me in Matthew 5, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now this is directed to a heterosexual male, of course, but it could be applied, obviously, to anyone. And it's an extremely uncomfortable statement, for me, anyway. Now I'll give you the leftist Jesus. The leftist Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions and give them to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. 
I wish Jesus had said neither of those things, but because I am a Christian, I have to take them seriously. I have to grapple with them. What I'm trying to argue is that um, the monotheistic religions include teachings that are profoundly uncomfortable both for individuals and for society. The question is not, is religion dangerous? It clearly is dangerous. The question is to find a religion, if you are inclined to find a religion, that you can trust, even if it presents you with some very uncomfortable and dangerous ideas. Hi. Um, so you said that you took these uh, things that Jesus has said seriously. And I was wondering, A, the extent of, I was wondering what that seriousness means, and also whether it extends to other biblical mandates that aren't so polite to talk about in society, like the, one, one force, like the commandment that forces uh, a rapist to marry his victim, or uh, the creation of actual provisions for slavery. Um, do you take these things seriously, and how do you grapple with them? Grapple is the word, I think. I don't know if I used that, but I think you used it, and it's a good one. Um, so I am not pretending that I have stopped, that I have never looked lustfully at a woman, nor that I have given all of my money to the poor. So one enters into um, a prayerful and thoughtful uh, negotiation, perhaps a, a conversation would be the word, uh, with Jesus uh, and with the text. Uh, and I think most uh, people arrive at very, very different interpretations of what they then, as individuals, are required to do. Um, obviously, that text about giving all that you have to the poor has the impact, I hope, on most Christians to be extremely generous with the, the material goods that they've been entrusted with. Um, I heard um, sort of a second part of your question, I think. And perhaps I couldn't quite uh, understand every word, but you seem to be talking about uh, aspects of the Bible that deal with slavery and that uh, Yes, for example, so, uh, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are creations of provisions for slavery that are harsher if the slave isn't a fellow Jew. Um, and so, yeah. OK, so certainly the Hebrew scriptures, or what Christians call the Old Testament, uh, assumes a slave society. Um, and there are various measures for protecting slave, for limiting slavery. Uh, the Christian New Testament documents also assume slavery, but in a situation very different from the Jewish situation in the Old Testament, because in the New Testament, the Christians are generally marginal people with very little political power and very little um, economic power. But there is no explicit anti-slavery teaching uh, in the New Testament. So what has happened here clearly is that a fundamental Christian principle has been working itself out through history. And I'm quite comfortable with that. Uh, it's hard, of course, to determine when you are in the midst of a situation whether it's working out in the, uh, what you perceive is the Christian principle working out or not. But I think in retrospect, we can say in this case that the Christian commitment to e the equality of all human beings is a very central doctrine. And that for it to unfold, it was necessary that slavery would have to go. Other questions? Hi, uh, I'm Kush. So I wanted to ask, are you saying that without Christianity, the system of apartheid would not have come to an end, or are you saying that would it still be in place without uh, Christianity? That's an interesting question. Historians um, toy with those things. That's called a counterfactual, as you probably know. What would have happened if something hadn't happened? Um, I've never thought about this question, but 
my gut feeling is to say that if the Christianity hadn't been there, well, okay, to set up the, prop the, the, the experiment correctly, Christianity would have been absent in South Africa, but it also would have been absent in the world generally, because I do believe that doctrines of human rights um, are derivative to a large degree from Christianity. So absent Christianity, both globally and in South Africa, I don't think it would have collapsed. But please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say that Christians alone accomplished this. Um, I'm trying to say on the one hand that Christians were complicit in keeping it going, and secondly, that the force of people who destroyed it involved many people other than Christians. I'm putting my emphasis only in part on Christian individuals acting, although they're very important, people like Bishop Tutu and so on. Um, but I'm putting most of my emphasis on the idea itself unfolding. Talking about understanding passages of the Bible in terms of fundamental religious ideas unfolding over time, are you not concerned or are you concerned that that gives too much freedom of interpretation to you as a personal reader of the Bible? Yes, I'm concerned. Um, because all sorts of bizarre things have happened and can happen as people uh, interpret the Bible alone. My own theology, I'm not a Catholic, but I tend somewhat in that direction because I think it really is important that the church as a whole body, and I don't particularly mean the Pope or bishops, but the church as a whole body, uh, presides over this evolution of understanding of Christian doctrine. I just don't think it's, um, I'm not comfortable with one person um, doing this, um, creating a new movement and a new church and so on and so forth. So I tend to take comfort from the broad pattern of the development of interpretation of scripture that takes place over time. You mentioned that the number one priority that we should probably have in mind when considering Christianity is its truth rather than its apparent effects, which seems to probably make sense. But I was wondering whether or not, since you said that one has to necessarily engage in a kind of negotiation with the text when one is reading it, and that the text might pose certain dangerous questions or possibilities for us as people with pre-existing opinions. Mm -hmm how one navigates the texts. If certain things seem threatening to me in the text, then I'm much less likely to accept those things and through negotiation with the texts, mm -hmm. I feel like rejecting them. Mm -hmm. uh, to, how exactly do you decide when or when not to accept something literally or spiritually or in any other way? No, that's a good question. Um, I think for the Christian, the answer has to do with the person of Christ. That is, stage one is confronting that person through the scriptures, possibly through prayer or, or who knows, even in mystical ways, but focusing the question on Jesus. Is Jesus a person I trust? Is he a truth teller? And then from that flow flows all of the, these difficult issues. Um, so the way that you posed it um, didn't sort of allow for the fact that there might be a personal relationship at the core of it, that it was a purely intellectual exercise. I don't know how this works for Islam or, or Judaism, but I think in Christianity it works in this personal way. Professor, what in your mind makes Christianity unique among moral systems or even among religions, including among the monotheistic religions? Well, again, I, uh, my answer will be rather similar to the answer that I gave the gentleman at the back. Um, it is the person of Christ. 
um, all of the, the basic notions of monotheism are present in Christianity as they are in the other two religions. Um, but in this case, you have quite astounding, well, you have an astounding person. I think everyone would agree he's astounding, who makes astounding claims for himself. Uh, and the, uh, those claims are what is distinctive about Christianity. And of course, it's that God became man, took upon himself the anguish and the pain and so forth of human rebellion against God, was, was killed, and three days again rose from the dead. These are ideas, of course, that are highly distinctive and, of course, highly controversial because Muslims and Jews and many other people uh, don't find them plausible and don't accept them. But surely that's the essence of what makes Christianity distinct. As for the moral system, um, I'm not prepared to say that there is a vast difference. Um, I'm not an expert on the other religions, but um, I think that the moral codes have an awful lot in common. Professor, thank you for your remarks tonight. Um, I was just curious, how would you respond to the, um, to the political stance that situations in Palestine right now, human rights violations, border on the situation of apartheid in South Africa, which um, you have spoken on tonight? Mm -hmm. And then how would, you, how would you justify or respond to current conservative evangelical Christian support for Israel despite the atrocities that we hear of so often? Okay, I, I'm going to largely evade the question. I hope you won't resent that because um, I, I don't know that this is the setting for that um, conversation. But let me say that I've given a lot of thought to the comparison between apartheid and, and the situation in Palestine. There are similarities um, and there are differences. From the Christian point of view, the sad thing is that uh, Christians are on both sides of that question because Many of the Palestinians, of course, are Christians. Um, and evangelical Christians have tended to support Israel. So to me, this is a painful and difficult subject that I, I just don't want to pronounce on in this setting. So I have two final questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, so you described these two ways in South Africa in which the Christian faith proved dangerous, particularly to the political situation there. Right? One was ended up being this negative force that mm -hmm. created apartheid. Mm -hmm. um, the other ended up being um, this positive force that led to democracy. What do you think caused the difference um, in those two cases? Hmm. The, what we're call, I mean, you and, you and I are agreeing on who the good guys and the bad guys <laughs> are in the story. Um, the bad guy side here is rooted in the fact that religions are not, uh, you say, I, I was given 20 minutes, so I talked about how religion can be subversive. But it can also be very conservative and very supportive of existing structures. Um, the, I said that religion can be, can provide and their Christianity so tightly that those two merged together and gave them comfort in what to them was a threatening situation uh, in, in South Africa. So that I think, but the conservative side of religion is not always bad of course, we think it is here. But I mean, you can be preserving things that really do matter as well. So I think monotheistic religions are, can be both subversive and can be conservative. Uh, and whether one favors them or not really is a matter of complex moral uh, reflection yeah. on the part of the observer. Um, and the last question that I think might help um, spark our conversations together. Um, what existing power structures today do you think religion or in particular the Christian faith is dangerous to? Oh, I think it's dangerous to us. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I am not a person of the hard left by any means, but I do think it's very dangerous to our acquisitive 
um, materialistic society. Okay, um, thank you, Professor Elphick, once again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.